Hi everyone. Hi there. And welcome back to Good Night Stars. Tonight we're reading the first chapter of Little House on the Prairie by Laura Ingalls Wilder. This has always been one of my favorite books and it's also my family's favorite book, which is why we don't have a back cover anymore. <laughs> it's okay to give your books a little love. Chapter one is called Going West. A long time ago, when all the grandfathers and grandmothers of today were little boys and little girls or very small babies, or perhaps not even born, Pa and Ma and Mary and Laura and baby Carrie left their little house in the big woods of Wisconsin. They drove away and left it lonely and empty in the clearing among the big trees, and they never saw the little house again. They were going to Indian country. Pa said there were too many people in the big woods now. Quite often, Laura heard the ringing thud of an ax, which was not Pa's ax, or the echo of a shot that did not come from his gun. The path that went by the little house had become a road. Almost every day, Laura and Mary stopped their playing and stared, at surprise, stared in surprise at a wagon slowly creaking by on the road. Wild animals would not stay in a country where there were so many people. Pa did not like to stay either. He liked a country where the wild animals lived without being afraid. He liked to see the little fawns and their mothers looking at him from the shadowy woods and the fat, lazy bears eating berries in the wild berry patches. In the long winter evenings, he talked to Ma about Western country. In the West, the, the land was level and there were no trees. The grass grew thick and high. There were wild animals wander there, the wild animals wandered and fed as though they were in a pasture that stretched much farther than a man could see. And there were no settlers, only Indians lived there. One day in the very last of the winter, Pa said to Ma, seeing you don't object, I've decided to go see the West. I've had an offer for this place and we can sell it now for as much as we're ever likely to get enough to give us a start in, the, in a new country. Oh, Charles, must we go now? Ma said. The weather was so cold and the snug house was so comfortable. If we are going this year, we must go now, said Pa. We can't get across the Mississippi after the ice breaks. So Pa sold the little house. He sold the cow and calf. He made hickory bows and fastened them upright to the wagon box. Ma helped him stretch the white canvas over them. In the thin dark before morning, Ma gently shook Mary and Laura till they got up. In firelight and candlelight, she washed and combed them and dressed them warmly. Over their long red flannel underwear, she put wool petticoats and wool dresses and long wool stockings. She put their coats on them and their rabbit skin hoods and their red yarn mittens. Everything from the little house was in the wagon, except the beds and tables and chairs. They did not need to take these because Pa could always make new ones. There was thin snow on the ground. The air was still and cold and dark. The bare trees stood up against the frosty stars. But in the east, the sky was pale and through the gray woods came lanterns with wagons and horses, bringing grandma and grandpa and aunts and uncles and cousins. Mary and Laura clung tight to their rag dolls and did not say anything. Their cousins stood around and looked at them. Grandma and all the aunts hugged and kissed them and hugged and kissed them again, saying goodbye. Pa hung his gun to the wagon bows inside the canvas top where he could reach it quickly from the seat. He hung his bullet pouch and powder horn beneath it. He laid the fiddle box carefully between pillows where jolting would not hurt the fiddle. The uncles helped him hitch the horses to the wagon. All the cousins were told to kiss Mary and Laura, so they did. Pa picked up Mary and then Laura and set them on the bed in the back of the wagon. 
He helped Ma climb up the wagon seat and Grandma reached up and gave her baby Carrie. Pa swung up and sat beside Ma and Jack, the, br the brindle bulldog, went under the wagon. So they all went from the little log house. The shutters were over the windows, so the little house could not see them go. It stayed there, inside the log fence, behind the two big oak trees that in the summertime had made green roofs for Mary and Laura to play under. And that was the last of the little house. Pa promised that when they came to the west, Laura should see a papoose. What is a papoose? she asked him. And he said a papoose is a little brown Indian baby. They drove a long way through the snowy woods till they came to the town of Pepin. Mary and Laura had seen it once before, but it looked different now. The door of the store and the doors of all the houses were shut. The stumps were covered with snow and no little children were playing outdoors. Big cords of wood stood among the stumps. Only two or three men in boots and fur caps and bright plaid coats were to be seen. Ma and Laura and Mary ate bread and molasses in the wagon, and the horses ate corn from nose bags, while inside the store, Pa traded his furs for things they would need on the journey. They could not stay long in the town because they must cross the lake that day. The enormous lake stretched flat and smooth and white all the way to the edge of the gray sky. Wagon tracks went across it so far that you could not see where they went. They ended in nothing at all. Pa drove the wagon out onto the ice following those wagon tracks. The horse's hooves clop clopped with a dull sound. The wagon wheels went crunching. The town grew smaller and smaller behind till even the tall store was only a dot. All around the wagon, there was nothing but empty silence and space. Laura didn't like it, but Pa was on the wagon seat and Jack was under the wagon. She knew that nothing could hurt her while Pa and Jack were there. At last the wagon was pulling up a slope of earth again, and again there were trees. There was a little log house too among the trees, so Laura felt better. Nobody lived in the little house. It was a place to camp in. It was a tiny house and strange, with a big fireplace and rough bunks against all the walls. But it was warm when Pa had built a fireplace. That night, Mary and Laura and baby Carrie slept with Ma in a bed made on the floor before the fire, while Pa slept outside in the wagon to guard it and the horses. At night, a strange noise wakened Laura. It sounded like a shot, but it was sharper and longer than a shot. Again and again, she heard it. Mary and Carrie were asleep, but Laura couldn't sleep until Ma's voice came softly through the dark. Go to sleep, Laura, Ma said. It's only the ice cracking. Next morning, Pa said, it's lucky we crossed yesterday, Caroline. Wouldn't wonder if the ice broke up today. We made a late crossing and we're lucky it didn't start breaking up while we were out in the middle of it. I thought about that yesterday, Charles, Ma replied gently. Laura hadn't thought about it before, but now she thought what would have happened if the ice had cracked under the wagon wheels and they had all gone down in the cold water in the middle of that vast lake. You're frightening somebody, Charles, Ma said, and Pa caught Laura up in his safe, big hug. We're across the Mississippi, he said, hugging her joyously. How do you like that little half pint of sweet cider, half drunk up? Do you like going out west where Indians live? Laura said she liked it, and she asked if they were in Indian country now, but they were not. They were in Minnesota. It was a long, long way to Indian territory. Almost every day, the horses traveled as far as they could. Almost every night, Pa and Ma made camp in a new place. Sometimes they had to stay several days in one camp because a creek was in flood and they couldn't cross it till the water went down. They crossed too many creeks to count. They saw strange woods and hills and stranger country with no trees. They drove across rivers on long wooden bridges and they came to one wide yellow river that had no bridge. That was the Missouri River. Pa drove onto a raft and they all sat still in the wagon while the raft went swaying away from the safe land and slowly crossed all that muddy yellow water. After more days, they came to hills again. In a valley, the wagon stuck fast in deep black mud. Rain poured down and thunder crashed and lightning flared. There was no place to make camp and build a fire. 
Everything was damp and chill and miserable in the wagon, but they had to stay in it and eat cold bits of food. Next day, Pa found a place on a hillside where they could camp. The rain stopped, but they had to wait a week before the creek went down and the mud dried so that Pa could dig the wagon wheels out of it and go on. One day while they were waiting, a tall lean man came out of the woods riding a black pony. He and Pa talked a while, then they went off into the woods together, and when they came back, both of them were riding black ponies. Pa had traded the tired brown horses for those ponies. They were beautiful little horses, and Pa said they were not really ponies, they were western mustangs. They're strong as mules and gentle as kittens, Pa, Pa, pa said. They had large, soft, gentle eyes and long manes and tails and slender legs and feet much smaller and quicker than the feet of horses in the big woods. When Laura asked what their names were, Pa said that she and Mary could name them. So Mary named one Pet and Laura named the other Patty. When the creek's roar was not so loud and the, roar and the road was drier, Pa dug the wagon out of the mud. He hitched Pet and Patty to it and they all went on together. They had come in, covered wag in the covered wagon all the long way from the big woods of Wisconsin across Minnesota and Iowa and Missouri. All that long way, Jack had trotted under the wagon. Now they set out to go across Kansas. Kansas was an endless flatland covered with tall grass blowing in the wind. Day after day, they traveled in Kansas and saw nothing but the rippling grass and enormous sky. In a perfect circle, the sky curved down to the level land, and the wagon was in the circle's exact middle. All day long, Pet and Patty went forward, trotting and walking and trotting again, but they couldn't get out of the middle of that circle. When the sun went down, the circle was still around them, and the edge of the sky was pink. Then slowly, the land became black. The wind made a lonely sound in the grass. The campfire was small and lost in so much space. But large stars hung from the sky, glittering so near that Laura felt she could almost touch them. The next day, the land was the same. The sky was the same. The circle did not change. Laura and Mary were tired of them all. There was nothing new to do and nothing to look at. The bed was made in the back of the wagon and neatly covered with a gray blanket. Laura and Mary sat on it. The canvas sides of the wagon top were rolled up and tied so the prairie wind blew in. It whipped Laura's straight brown hair and Mary's golden curls every which way, and the strong light screwed up their eyelids. Sometimes a big jackrabbit bounded in big bounds away over the blowing grass. Jack paid no attention. Poor Jack was tired too, and his paws were sore from traveling so far. The wagon kept on jolting. The canvas top snapped in the wind. Two faint wheels kept going away behind the wagon, always the same. Pa's back was hunched. The reins were loose in his hands. The wind blew his long brown beard. Ma sat straight and quiet, her hands folded in her lap. Baby Carrie slept in a nest among the bundles. Ah, oh, wow, Mary yawned and Laura said, Ma, can't we get out and run behind the wagon? My legs are so tired. No, Laura, Ma said. Aren't we going to camp pretty soon? Laura asked. It seemed such a long time since noon when they had eaten their lunch sitting on the clean grass in the shade of the wagon. Pa answered, not yet. It's too early to camp now. I want to camp now. I'm so tired, Laura said. Then Ma said, Laura. That was all, but it meant that Laura must not complain. So she did not complain anymore out loud, but she was still naughty inside. She sat and thought complaints to herself. Her legs ached and the wind wouldn't stop blowing her hair. The grass waved and the wagon jolted and nothing else happened for a long time. We're coming to a creek or a river, Pa said. Girls, can you see those trees ahead? Laura stood up and held to one of the wagon bows. She, far ahead, she saw a low dark smudge. That's trees, Pa said. You can tell by the shape of the shadows. In the country, trees mean water. That's where we'll camp tonight. Okay. Finished with chapter one of Little House on the Prairie by Laura Ingalls Wilder. Thank you so much for joining me. And until next time, 
Good night, stars. Hi there, and welcome to Good Night Stars, or welcome back to Good Night Stars. Tonight we are reading Chapter 2 of Little House on the Prairie by Laura Ingalls Wilder. This story is about Laura's life, and so she's writing what she remembers from her childhood. Crossing the Creek Pet and Patty began to trot briskly as if they were glad to. Laura held tight to the wagon bow and stood in the jolting wagon. Beyond Pa's shoulder and far across the waves of green grass, she could see the trees, and they were not like any trees that she had seen before. They were no taller than bushes. Whoa, said Pa suddenly. Now, which way? He muttered to himself. The road divided here, and you could not tell which was the more traveled way. Both of them were faint wheel tracks in the grass. One went toward the west, the other sloped downward a little toward the south. Both soon vanished in the tall, blowing grass. Better to go downhill, I guess, Pa decided. The creek's down in the bottoms. Must be this is the way to the ford. He turned to Pet and Patty toward the south. The road went up and down and up again over the gently curving land. The trees were nearer now, but they were no taller. Then Laura grasped and clutched the wagon bow, for almost under Pet and Patty's noses, there was no more blowing grass. There was no land at all. She looked beyond the edge of the land and across the tops of the trees. The road turned there. For a little while, it went along the cliff's top and then it sharply went downward. Pa put on the brakes. Pet and Patty braced themselves backward and almost sat down. The wagon wheels slid onward, little by little, lowering the wagon farther down the steep slope into the ground. Jagged cliffs of bare red earth rose up on both sides of the wagon. Grass waved along their tops, but nothing grew on their seamed straight up and down sides. They were hot and heat came from them against Laura's face. The wind was still blowing overhead, but it did not blow down into this deep crack in the ground. The stillness seemed strange and empty. Then once more, the wagon was level. The narrow crack down which it had come opened into the bottom lands. Here grew the tall trees whose tops Laura had seen from the prairie above. Shady groves were scattered on the rolling meadows and in the groves, deer were lying down, hardly to be seen among the shadows. The deer turned their heads towards the wagon and curious fawns stood up to see it more clearly. Laura was surprised because she did not see the creek, but the bottom lands were wide. Down there, below the prairie, there were gentle hills and open sunny places. The air was still and hot. Under the wagon wheels, the ground was soft. In the sunny open spaces, the grass grew thin and deer had cropped it short. For a while, the high, bare cliffs of red earth stood up behind the wagon, but they were almost hidden behind the hills and trees when Pet and Patty stopped to drink from the creek. The rushing sound of the water filled the still air. All along the creek banks, the trees hung over it and made it dark with shadows. In the middle, it ran swiftly, sparkling and blue. This creek's pretty high, Pa said, but I guess we can make it all right. You could see this is a ford by the old wheel ruts. What do you say, Caroline? Whatever you say, Charles, Ma answered. Pet and Patty lifted their wet noses. They pricked their ears forward, looking at the creek. Then they pricked them backward to hear what Pa would say. They sighed and laid their soft noses together to whisper to each other. A little way upstream, Jack was lapping the water with his red tongue. I'll tie down the wagon cover, Pa said. He climbed down from the seat, unrolled the canvas sides and tied them firmly to the wagon box. Then he pulled a rope at the back so that the canvas puckered together in the middle, leaving only a tiny round hole too small to see through. Mary huddled down on the bed. She did not like fords. She was afraid of the rushing water. But Laura was excited. 
Sheep liked the splashing. Pa climbed the seat, saying they may, they may have to swim out there in the middle, but we'll make it all right, Caroline. Jack, Laura thought of Jack and said, I wish Jack could ride in the wagon, Pa. Pa did not answer. He gathered the reins tightly in his hands. Ma said, Jack can swim, Laura. He will be all right. The wagon went forward softly in the mud. Water began to splash against the wheels. The splashing grew louder. The wagon shook as the noisy water struck at it. Then all at once the wagon lifted and balanced and swayed. It was a lovely feeling. The noise stopped and Ma said sharply, lie down girls. Quick as a flash, Mary and Laura dropped flat on the bed. When Ma spoke like that, they did as they were told. Ma's arm pulled a smothering blanket over them, heads and all. Be still, just as you are. Don't move, she said. Mary did not move. She was trembling and still. But Laura could not help wriggling a little bit. She did so want to see what's happening. She could feel the wagon swaying and turning. The splashing was noisy again. And at, again, it died away. Then Pa's voice frightened Laura. It said, take them, Caroline. The wagon lurched. There was a sudden heavy splash beside it. Laura sat straight up and clawed the blanket from her head. Pa was gone. Ma sat alone, holding tight to the reins with both hands. Mary hid her face in the blanket again, but Laura rose up farther. She couldn't see the creek bank. She couldn't see anything in front of the wagon but water rushing at it. And in the water, three heads. Pet's head and Patty's head and Pa's small wet head. Pa's fist in the water was holding tight to Pet's bridle. Laura could faintly hear Pa's voice through the rushing of the water. It sounded calm and cheerful, but she couldn't hear what he said. He was talking to the horses. Ma's face was white and scared. Lie down, Laura, Ma said. Laura lay down. She felt cold and sick. Her eyes were shut tight, but she could still see the terrible water and Pa's brown beard drowning in it. For a long, long time, the wagon swayed and swung and Mary cried without making a noise. And Laura's stomach felt sicker and sicker then the front wheel struck and grated and Pa shouted. The whole wagon jerked and jolted and tipped backward, but the wheels were turning on the ground. Laura was up again, holding to the seat. She saw Pet and Patty scrambling wet backs, climbing a steep bank, and Pa running beside them, shouting, Hi, Patty! Hi, Pet! Get up! Get up! Whoopsie-daisy! Good girls! At the top of the bank, they stood still, panting and dripping, and the wagon stood still, safely out of that creek. Pa stood panting and dripping too, and Ma said, Oh, Charles. There, there, Caroline, Pa said. We're all safe, thanks to a good tight wagon box well fastened to the running gear. I never saw a creek rise so fast in my life. Pet and Patty are good swimmers, but I guess they wouldn't have made it if I hadn't helped them. If Pa had not known what to do, or if Ma had been too frightened to drive, or if Laura and Mary had been naughty and bothered her, then they all would have been lost. The river would have rolled them over and over and carried them away and drowned them, and nobody would have ever known what became of them. For weeks, perhaps, no other person would come along that road. Well, Pa said, all's well that ends well. And Ma said, Charles, you're wet to the skin. Before Pa could answer, Laura cried, oh, where's Jack? They had forgotten Jack. They had left him on the other side of that dreadful water and now they could not see him anywhere. He must have tried to swim after them, but they could not see him struggling in the water now. Laura swallowed hard to keep from crying. She knew it was shameful to cry, but there was crying inside her. 
all the long way from Wisconsin, poor Jack had followed them so patiently and faithfully, and now they had let him drown? He was so tired, and they might have taken him in, into the wagon. He had stood on the bank and seen the wagon going away from him, as if they didn't care for him at all, and he would never know how much they wanted him. Pa said he wouldn't have done such a thing to Jack, not for a million dollars. If he'd known how that creek would rise when they were in midstream, he would never have let Jack try to swim it. But that can't be helped now, he said. He went far up and down the creek bank, looking for Jack, calling him and whistling for him. It was no use. Jack was gone. At last, there was nothing to do but to go on. Pet and Patty were rested. Pa's clothes had dried on him while he searched for Jack. He took the reins again and drove uphill out of the river bottoms. Laura looked back all the way. She knew she wouldn't see Jack again, but she wanted to. She didn't see anything but low curves of land coming between the wagon and the creek and beyond the creek, those strange cliffs of red earth rose up again. Then the other bluffs, just like them, stood up in front of the wagon. Faint wheel tracks went into a crack between those earthen walls. Pet and Patty climbed till the crack became a small grassy valley, and the valley widened out onto the high prairie once more. No road, not even the faintest trace of wheels or of a rider's passing could be seen anywhere. That prairie looked as if no human eye had ever seen it before. Only the tall, wild grass covered the endless, empty land, and a great empty sky arched over it. Far away, the sun's edge torched the rim of the earth. The sun was enormous, and it was throbbing and pulsing with light. All around the sky's edge ran a pale pink glow, and above the pink was yellow, and above that was blue. Above the blue, the sky was no color at all. Purple shadows were gathering over the land, and the wind was mourning. Pa stopped the Mustangs. He and Ma got out of the wagon to make camp, and Mary and Laura climbed down to the ground too. Oh, Ma, Laura begged. Jack has gone to heaven, hasn't he? He was such a good dog. Can't he go to heaven? Ma did not know what to answer, but Pa said, yes, Laura, he can. God that doesn't forget the sparrows won't let a good dog like Jack out in the cold. Laura felt only a little better. She was not happy. Pa did not whistle about his work as usual, and after a while he said, and what we'll do in a wild country without a good watchdog, I don't know. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, good night, stars. Hi there, and welcome back to Goodnight Stars. Tonight we are reading Chapter 3 of Little House on the Prairie, which is called Camp on the High Prairie. Pa made camp as usual. First, he unhitched and unharnessed Pet and Patty, and he put them on their picket lines. Picket lines were long ropes fastened to iron pegs driven into the ground. The pegs were called picket pins. When horses were on the picket lines, they could eat all the grass that the long ropes would let them reach. But when Pet and Patty were put on them, the first thing they did was to lie down and roll back and forth and over. They rolled till the feeling of the harness was all gone from their backs. While Pet and Patty were rolling, Pa pulled all the grass from a large round space of ground. There was old dead grass at the roots of the green grass, and Pa would take no chance of setting the prairie on fire. If fire once started in that dry undergrass, it would sweep that whole country bare and black. Pa said, best be on the safe side. It saves trouble in the end. When the space was clear of grass, Pa laid a handful of dry grass in its center. From the creek bottoms, he brought an armful of twigs and dead wood. He laid small twigs and larger twigs and then the wood on the handful of dry grass and he lighted the grass. 
The fire crackled merrily inside the ring of bare ground that it couldn't get out of. Then Pa brought water from the creek while Mary and Laura helped Ma get supper. Ma measured coffee beans into the coffee mill and Mary ground them. Laura filled the coffee pot with water Pa brought and Ma set the pot in the coals. She set the iron bake oven in the coals too. While it heated, she mixed cornmeal and salt with water and patted it into little cakes. She greased the bake oven with a pork rind, laid the cornmeal cakes on it and put on its iron cover. Then Pa raked more coals over the cover while Ma sliced fat salt pork. She fried the slices in the iron spider. The spider had short legs to stand on in the coals, and that was why it was called a spider. If it had had no legs, it would have only been a frying pan. The coffee boiled and the cakes baked, the meat fried, and they all smelled so good that Laura grew hungrier and hungrier. Pa set the wagon seat near the fire. He and Ma sat on it. Mary and Laura sat on the wagon tongue. Each of them had a tin plate and a steel knife and a steel fork with white bone handles. Ma had a tin cup and Pa had a tin cup and baby Carrie had a little one all her own, but Mary and Laura had to share their tin cup. They drank water. They could not drink coffee until they grew up. While they were eating supper, the purple shadows, cl shadows closed around the campfire. The vast prairie was dark and still. Only the wind moved stealthily through the grass and the large low stars hung glittering from the great sky. The campfire was cozy in the big chill darkness. The slices of pork were crisp and fat. The corn cakes were good. In the dark beyond the wagon, Pet and Patty were eating too. They bit off bites of grass with sharply crunching sounds. We'll camp here a day or two, said Pa. Maybe we'll stay here. There's good land, timber in the bottoms, plenty of game, everything a man could want. What do you say, Caroline? We might go farther and fare worse, Ma replied. Anyway, I'll look around tomorrow, Pa said. I'll take my gun and get us some good fresh meat. He lighted his pipe with a hot coal and stretched out his legs comfortably. The warm brown smell of tobacco smoke mixed with the warmth of the fire. Mary yawned and slid off the wagon tongue to sit on the grass. Laura yawned too. Ma quickly washed the tin plates, the tin cups, the knives and forks. She washed the bake oven and the spider and rinsed the dishcloth. For an instant, she was still listening to the long wailing howl from the dark prairie. They all knew what it was, but that sound always ran cold up Laura's backbone and crinkled over the back of her head. Ma shook the dishcloth and then she walked into the dark and spread the cloth on the tall grass to dry. When she came back, Pa said, wolves, half a mile away, I'll judge. Well, when there's deer, there will be wolves. I wish, he didn't say what he wished, but Laura knew. He wished Jack were there. When the wolves howled in the big woods, Laura had always known that Jack would not let them hurt her. A lump swelled hard in her throat and her nose smarted. She winked fast and did not cry. That wolf, or perhaps another wolf, howled again. Bedtime for little girls, Ma said cheerfully. Mary got up and turned around so that Ma could unbutton her, but Laura jumped up and stood still. She saw something. Deep in the dark beyond the firelight, two green lights were shining near the ground. They were eyes. Cold ran up Laura's backbone, her scalp crinkled and her hair stood up. The green lights moved, one winked out, and then the other winked out. Then both shone steadily, coming nearer. Look, Pa, look, Laura said, a wolf. Pa did not seem to move quickly, but he did. In an instant, he took his gun out of the wagon and was ready to fire at those green eyes. The eyes stopped coming. 
They were still in the dark, looking at him. It can't be a wolf, unless it's a mad wolf, Pa said. Ma lifted Mary into the wagon. And it's not that, said Pa. Listen to the horses. Pet and Patty were still biting off bits of grass. A lynx, said Ma. Or a coyote, Pa picked up a stick of wood. He shouted and threw it. The green eyes went close to the ground as if the animal crouched to spring. Pa held the gun ready. The creature did not move. Don't, Charles, Ma said. But Pa slowly walked towards those eyes and slowly along the ground, the eyes crawled toward him. Laura could see the animal in the edge of the dark. It was a tawny animal and bridled. Then Pa shouted and Laura screamed. The next thing she knew, she was trying to hug a jumping, panting, wriggling Jack who lapped her face and hands with his warm, wet tongue. She couldn't hold him. He leaped and wriggled from her to Pa, to Ma, and back to her again. Well, I'm beat, Pa said. So am I, said Ma. But did you have to wake the baby? She rocked Carrie in her arms, hushing her. Jack was perfectly well, but soon he lay down close to Laura and sighed a long sigh. His eyes were red with tiredness and all the under part of him was caked with mud. Ma gave him a cornmeal cake and he licked it and wagged politely, but he could not eat. He was too tired. No telling how long he kept swimming, Pa said, nor how far he was carried downstream before he landed. And when at last he reached them, Laura called him a wolf and Pa threatened to shoot him. But Jack knew they didn't mean it. Laura asked him, you knew we didn't mean it, didn't you, Jack? Jack wagged his stump of a tail. He knew. It was past bedtime. Pa chained Pat, Pet and Patty to the feed box at the back of the wagon to feed them their corn. Carrie slept again and Ma helped Mary and Laura undress. She put their long nightgowns over their heads while they stuck their arms into the sleeves. They buttoned the neckbands themselves and tied the strings of their nightcaps beneath their chins. Under the wagon, Jack wearily turned around three times and lay down to sleep. In the wagon, Laura and Mary said their prayers and crawled into their little bed. Ma kissed them goodnight. On the other side of the canvas, Pet and Patty were eating their corn. When Patty whooshed into the feed box, the whoosh was right at Laura's ear. There were little scurrying sounds in the grass. In the trees by the creek, an owl said, hoo-hoo, hoo-hoo. Farther away, another owl answered, hoo-hoo, hoo-hoo. Far away on the prairie, the wolves howled, and under the wagon, Jack growled low in his chest. In the wagon, everything was safe and snug. Thickly in front of the open wagon top hung the large glittering stars. Pa could reach them, Laura thought. She wished he would pick the largest one from the thread on which it hung from the sky and give it to her. She was wide awake. She was not sleepy at all, but suddenly she was very much surprised. A large star winked at her. Then she was waking up the next morning. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, good night, stars. Hi there, and welcome to Good Night Stars, or welcome back to Good Night Stars. Tonight we are reading the fourth chapter of Little House on the Prairie by Laura Ingalls Wilder. Keep in mind that this book is written by Laura about her life. And so this is what she remembers from growing up. This chapter is called Prairie Day. Soft wickerings were close to Laura's ear and grain rattled into the feed box. Pa was giving Pet and Patty their breakfasts. Back, Pet, don't be greedy, he said. You know it's Patty's turn. Pet stamped her foot and nickered. Now, Patty, keep your own end of the box, Pa said. This is for Pet. Then a little squeal from Patty. Ha, 
got nipped, didn't you, Pa said, and serves you right. I told you to eat your own corn. Mary and Laura looked at each other and left. They could smell bacon and coffee and hear pancakes sizzling, and they scrambled out of bed. Mary could dress herself all but the middle button. Laura buttoned that one for her, and then Mary buttoned Laura all the way up the back. They washed their hands and faces in the tin wash basin on the wagon step. Ma combed every snarl out of their hair, while Pa brought fresh water from the creek. Then they sat on the clean grass and ate pancakes and bacon and molasses from the tin plates in their laps. All around them, shadows were moving over the waving grasses while the sun rose. Meadow larks were springing straight up from the billows of grass into the high, clear sky, singing as they went. Small pearly clouds drifted in the intense blueness overhead. In all the weed tops, tiny birds were singing and singing in tiny voices. Pa said that they were dick sissels. Dicky, dicky, Laura called to them. Dicky bird. Eat your breakfast, Laura, Ma said. You must mind your manners, even if we are a hundred miles from anywhere. Pa said mildly, it's only 40 miles to Independence, Caroline. And no doubt there's a neighbor or so nearer than that. 40 miles then, Ma agreed, but whether or no, it isn't good manners to sing at the table. Or when you're eating, she added, because there was no table. There was only the enormous empty prairie with grasses blowing in waves of light and shadow across it and the great blue sky above it and birds flying up from it and singing with joy because the sun was rising. And on the whole enormous prairie, there was no sign that any other human being had ever been there. In that space of land and sky stood the lonely small covered wagon and close to it sat Ma and Pa and Lori and Laura and Mary and baby Carrie eating their breakfasts. The Mustangs munched their corn and Jack sat still trying hard not to beg. Laura was not allowed to feed him while she ate, but she saved bits for him. And Ma made a big pancake for him of the last of the batter. Rabbits were everywhere in the grass and thousands of prairie chickens, but Jack could not hunt his breakfast that day. Pa was going hunting and Jack must guard the camp. First, Pa put Pet and Patty on their picket lines. Then he took the wooden tub from the side of the wagon and filled it with water from the creek. Ma was going to do the washing. Then Pa stuck his sharp hatchet in his belt. He hung his powder horn beside the hatchet. He put the patch box and the bullet pouch in his pocket and he took his gun on his arm. He said to Ma, take your time, Caroline. We won't move the wagon until we want to. We've got all the time there is. He went away. For a little while, they could see the upper part of him above the tall grasses going away and growing smaller. Then he was out of sight and the prairie was empty. Mary and Laura washed the dishes while Ma made the beds in the wagon. They put the clean dishes neatly in their box. They picked up every scattered twig and put it in the fire. They stacked the wood against the wagon wheel. Then everything about the camp was tidy. Ma brought the wooden pannikin of soft soap from the wagon. She kilted up her skirts and rolled up her sleeves and she knelt by the tub on the grass. She washed sheets and pillowcases and white underthings. She washed dresses and shirts and she rinsed them in the clear water and spread them on the clean grass to dry in the sun. Mary and Laura were exploring. They must not go far from the wagon, but it was fun to run through the tall grass in the sunshine and wind. Huge rabbits bounded away before them. Birds fluttered up and settled again. The tiny dicky birds were everywhere and their tiny nests were in the tall weeds. And everywhere were, these little, were the little brown striped gophers. These little creatures looked soft as velvet. They had bright round eyes and crinkling noses and wee paws. They popped out of the holes in the ground and they stood up to look at Mary and Laura. Their hind legs folded under their haunches and their little paws 
folded tight to their chests, and they looked exactly like bits of dead wood sticking out of the ground. Only their bright eyes glittered. Mary and Laura wanted to catch one to take to Ma. Again and again, they almost had one. The gopher would stand perfectly still until you were sure that you had him this time, but then just as you touched him, he wasn't there. There was only his round hole in the ground. Laura ran and ran and she couldn't catch one. Mary sat perfectly still beside a hole, waiting for one to come up, and just beyond her reach, gophers scampered merrily and gophers sat up and they looked at her, but not one ever came out of that hole. Once, a shadow floated across the grass and every gopher vanished. A hawk was sailing overhead. It was so close that Laura saw its cruel round eye looking downward to look at her. She saw its sharp beak and its savage claws curled ready to pounce. But the hawk saw nothing but Laura and Mary and round empty holes in the ground. It sailed away, looking somewhere else for its dinner. Then all the little gophers came up again. It was nearly noon then. The sun was almost overhead. So Laura and Mary picked flowers from the weeds and they took the flowers to Ma instead of the gopher. Ma was folding the dry clothes. The little panties and petticoats were whiter than the snow, warm from the sun and smelling like the grass. Ma laid them in the wagon and took the flowers. She admired equally the flowers that Laura gave her and the flowers that Mary gave her. And she put them together in a tin cup full of water. She set them on the wagon step and made, to make the camp pretty. Then she split two cold corn cakes and spread them with molasses. She gave one to Mary and one to Laura. That was their dinner and it was very good. Where is a papoose, Ma? Laura asked. Don't speak with your mouth full, Laura, said Ma. So Laura chewed and swallowed and she said, I want to see a papoose. Mercy on us, Ma said. Whatever makes you want to see Indians, we will see enough of them, more than we want to, I wouldn't wonder. They wouldn't hurt us, would they? Mary asked. Mary was always good. She never spoke with her mouth full. No, Ma said. Don't get such an idea into your head. Why don't you like Indians, Ma? Laura asked as she caught a drip of molasses with her tongue. I just don't like them and don't lick your fingers, Laura, said Ma. This is Indian country, isn't it? Laura said. What did we come to their country for if you don't like them? Ma said she didn't know whether this was Indian country or not. She didn't know where the Kansas line was, but whether or no, the Indians would not be here long. Pa had a word from a man in Washington that the Indian territory would be open to settlement soon. It might already be open to settlement. They could not know because Washington was so far away. Then Ma took the sad iron out of the wagon and heated it by the fire. She sprinkled a dress for Mary and a dress for Laura and a little dress for baby Carrie and her own sprigged calico. She spread a blanket and a sheet on the wagon seat and she ironed the dresses. Baby Carrie slept in the wagon. Laura and Mary and Jack lay on the shady grass beside it because now the sunshine was hot. Jack's mouth was open and his red tongue hung out. His eyes blinked sleepily. Ma hummed softly to herself while the iron smoothed all of the wrinkles out of the little dresses. All around them to the very edge of the world, there was nothing but grasses waving in the wind. Far overhead, a few white puffs of clouds sailed in the thin blue air. Laura was very happy. The wind sang a low rustling song in the grass. Grasshoppers rasping quivered up from an immense prairie. A buzzing came faintly from all the trees in the creek bottoms. But these sounds made a great, warm, happy silence. Laura had never seen a place she liked so much as this one. She didn't know she had gone to sleep until she woke up. Jack was on his feet, wagging his stump tail. The sun was low and Pa was coming across the prairie. Laura jumped up and ran and his long shadow stretched to meet her in the waving grasses. He held up the game in his hand for her to see. He had a rabbit, 
the largest rabbit she had ever seen, and two plump prairie hens. Laura jumped up and down and clapped her hands and squealed. Then she caught hold of his other sleeve and hippity-hopped through the tall grasses beside him. This country's cram-jammed with game, he told her. I saw 50 deer if I saw one, an antelope and squirrels, rabbits, birds of all kinds, the creek's full of fish. He said to Ma, I tell you, Caroline, there's everything we want here. We can live like kings. That was a wonderful supper. They sat by the campfire and ate the tender, savory, flavory meat till they could eat no more. When at last Laura set down her plate, she sighed with contentment. She didn't want anything more in the world. The last color was fading from the enormous sky and all the level land was shadowy. The warmth of the fire was pleasant because the night wind was cool. Phoebe birds called sadly from the woods down by the creek. For a little while, a mockingbird sang. Then the stars came out and the birds were still. Softly, Pa's fiddle sang in the starlight. Sometimes he sang a little and sometimes the fiddle sang alone. Sweet and thin and far away, the fiddle went on singing. No one knew thee but to love thee, thou dear one of my heart. The large bright stars hung down from the sky. Lower and lower they came, quivering with music. Laura gasped and Ma came quickly. What is it, Laura? She asked and Laura whispered, the stars were singing. You've been asleep, Ma said. It is only the fiddle, and it's time little girls were in bed. She undressed Laura in the firelight and put her nightgown on and tied her nightcap and tucked her into bed. But the fiddle was still singing in the starlight. The night was full of music, and Laura was sure that part of it came from the great bright stars swinging so low above the prairie. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. And until next time, good night, stars.